Hey, it's Rob Fitzgerald again. Thanks for tuning in. Um, we're going to give a quick introduction to toxicology, talk about some of the different kinds of specimens that uh, you might want to submit to the toxicology lab, and just some general principles. Uh, I think I've got seven slides. And then we're going to, in subsequent uh, presentations, we're going to talk about specific uh, uh, toxicities. Um, so the father of toxicology was Paracelsus, and he came up with his statement, dosis sola facet venenum, which essentially means that solely the dose determines toxicity. And that's a really central tenet of, uh, of toxicology. You know, anything is toxic if you take too much of it. Um, seems like Paracelsus might have had a little bit of a, an attitude problem. Uh, he was born uh, Philip von Holmheim, and uh, that wasn't quite good enough for him, so he decided to pick up the name Philippus Bombastus Aurelius, von Helmheide, um, and so I think that made him feel a little bit better, but he wasn't quite satisfied, so he said, well, who's the best scientist so far? That was clearly Celsus, so I'm going to give myself the name Paracelsus, and so since then he was known as Paracelsus. So uh, sample types to submit for overdose patient. Um, blood samples, and by blood I mean blood plasma serum, um, we, we use that for things where, that we can correlate concentrations um, and effects. So the, the, the central tenet is is that concentrations in circulation are in equilibrium with the receptors where they're having action and there can be a, if there's a quantitative relationship then we want a, a blood sample. So things like acetaminophen, salicylates, alcohol, iron, those are, those are good examples of, of where you might want to submit a blood sample because we can correlate effects to concentrations that we can measure. Um, urine specimens are often given when we're looking for a longer window of detection. So drugs of abuse, we want to be able to pick up people for days or weeks. Um, a urine specimen is, is where the drugs typically get concentrated and excreted and, and thus where we can find uh, either metabolites or parent drug. Gastric fluid can be useful if it's an acute overdose and we don't know what it is. Oftentimes, gastric contents might have really high concentrations and that can help us identify the drug. And, uh, and move forward from there. Um, pills, capsules, tablets, um, especially in forensic cases, uh, those things also become important, again, because it helps us direct where our search is going to be. Um, and clearly, the, the clinical history is really important. Um, you know, what are the signs and symptoms? Um, and, you know, if we identify something, we can correlate that to what the clinical findings were. So, uh, really important. Um, so what is a drug screen? A drug screen is different every place you go, and so you need to figure that out when you come to a new hospital or a new laboratory that you're using, um, what is the, the basis of their drug screens, because none of them are universal, um, and that's why I say it's important to understand each individual one. So most laboratories today are using immunoassay-based drug screens, and you have to be looking for it to find it. So you have to, you might have a, an immunoassay for opiates, and that's going to pick up codeine and morphine, but it won't pick up like methadone or oxycodone. So um, understanding exactly what your screen uh, includes is, is important, and the only way to know that is to t is to talk with your laboratory. Um, if you do a, a broad spectrum screen, um, you can detect things that you're not looking for. So. Um, and there's different ways to do that. Um, methods using mass spectrometry are, are typically in favor for doing that. Um, if you do a broad spectrum screen, one in four shows at least one unsuspected drug, and one in six detects only unsuspected drugs. So um, despite your careful history and what the patient is saying, um, by doing toxicology, you can find things that, that are unsuspected. Um, why do we do that? Uh, for certain things, there are very specific treatment protocols. Acetaminophen, for example, um, uh, iron, and so uh, you know, doing drug screens, <coughs> excuse me, can be useful uh, in, in those regards. Um, a negative report also might trigger you to think about some other organic causes of, you know, maybe they're a psychotic patient or and they need you know further. Uh, further support in, the, in that way. Um, so general treatment is, you know, if they're not breathing, then it doesn't really matter how fast the toxicology comes back. So protecting their airways, making sure they've got good circulation, and then we start to think about drugs. Um, supportive care is by far the, what happens in the vast majority of patients. 
Um, but there are antidotes, and we're going to talk about some of those. And some of those are clearly life-saving and, and, uh, and indicated. Um, hemodialysis can be used. Uh, um, peritoneal dialysis is not quite as effective. Um, hemoperfusion is not as effective. Um, sometimes hemodialysis can be very effective, and, and we'll talk about some of those cases when we talk about specific toxins. So just a, a brief review of pharmacokinetics. Um, Zero-order pharmacokinetics is where you're excreting a constant amount in time. And so a good example of that is ethanol. You saturate the ethanol metabolizing enzymes, and so you excrete, you know, 10 to 20 milligrams per deciliter per hour. Um, <clears throat> versus first-order pharmacokinetics, where you're excreting a constant percent in time. And so first-order pharmacokinetics is where half-lives apply. And what happens is, in, in an overdose situation, you move from first-order pharmacokinetics to zero-order pharmacokinetics as you saturate enzymes. And that's where you get some of the toxicities. Um, so half-life, you know what that is. It's time for half the drug to disappear. Um, things that change uh, first pass effect, um, you know, depends on what drugs you're talking about. Uh, they can be cleared orally but not... Um, so orally, where you're, you're ingesting it, it goes from your stomach to your liver, and your liver is metabolizing before it gets into uh, central circulation. Um, thinking about steady state, and if you're thinking about therapeutic drug monitoring, we think about steady state being reached. It's independent of the dose. It's independent of the dose interval. It only depends on the half-life of the drug. And so in about four half-lives, you reach steady state. So if you're making dose adjustments and you want to monitor, you know, have you reached the therapeutic range, you need to wait about four half-lives. Things that change pharmacokinetics that we typically monitor, renal function. So we look at GFR and some drugs, um, you change the dosing based on what the GFR is. Hepatic function, um, you can have induction by barbiturates, you can have uh, Drug, drug interactions that um, block metabolism of each other, and, and, you know, there's big databases when you put patients on drugs to make sure that you don't have drug-drug interactions um, that are at least known about. Um, saturated pharmacokinetics, uh, again, that's where we shift from uh, zero order, from first order to zero order, and sometimes what happens there is that we form different metabolites when we're saturated. And so acetaminophen is a good